ended, uh, was looking at chapter 3. Okay, so we've got observations that can come out of this. So chapter 1 was just here's science. Chapter 3 is now looking at matter. Okay, what is matter? What things kind of compose science and chemistry? What can we work with? Okay. And a lot of this is going to come back to observations. Well, we can categorize observations into two separate sections. We've got qualitative observations, and we have quantitative observations. So we've got a nice little picture here. What would be a qualitative observation? <laughs> we could look at the amount of wool, okay, or that that sheep has a bunch of wool on it. So we're making kind of a, just a general observation. Okay? We could almost look at it as as I was already describing with the organic aspects, kind of our touchy-feely descriptions. Yes, those are correct words, maybe. Um, just don't use a dictionary. We could also shift to the fact that there are two sheep, right? No, 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 in there. We've got one's head and back and the one in front. Right? The observation that there are two sheep, is that a touchy-feely observation? No, that's actually applying a number to it. We're quantifying what's being observed. That gets us our quantitative observations. We've got two sheep. So our quantitative are really kind of our number games. Okay. Our qualitative would be more of what we would kind of observe, which we can put in quotes. Yes, we are observing that there are two sheep, but our observation could be that they are white sheep. Okay. Or that one... Actually, we can't make any real statements. Actually, can anybody make any real statements? Are those male or female? I don't know enough about farm animals to figure that out, but I know a few students do have fuzzy that ability. Okay, well, then let's just stick with that. White and fuzzy. Okay. Those are our qualitative observations. Okay, we can draw conclusions from both, but depending on what we're trying to do, we may only want to look at the quantitative observations or the qualitative. What we're going to focus on in chapter 3 is primarily the qualitative stuff. Right? We aren't going to put as much numbers into it. Chapter 2, when we step backwards, is going to bring in the quantitative. So we're also going to start looking at units and numbers and calculations and how can we show these different things and plot them and all sorts of other fun jets. Okay? Um, organic chemistry relies kind of in the qualitative section, which is personally why I like it because I don't like numbers very much. In that qualitative area, we can still draw a lot of conclusions. We can predict how molecules are going to react with each other. It does rely a little bit on the quantitative, but we can make some simple approximations and get through it pretty quickly. Most of what we will see in general chemistry is quantitative. You're getting in at hardcore mathematics, hardcore in quotes, I guess, uh, mathematical interpretations of everything. You aren't getting as much of that kind of qualitative conclusion. Okay, so just be aware of uh, those situations. So, our qualitative observations. 70-80% of life is composed of water. Okay. Yeah, carbon shows up, but water is more abundant. Okay. We see water all over the planet. Okay. Why might we look at water as our first place to observe chemistry? What was that? It's not an element, so that's an interesting question. We say water. What is water? Does anybody know what the chemical formula is for water? H2O. It's H2O. What we're saying by that is that we have hydrogen and we have oxygen as elements within this. What does that two represent? There are two hydrogens per one oxygen atom. Okay, so we've got something with a formula. So we could start to look at something like that. It's not a base element, but it is one of the first things that we observe. So we think back to 800 years ago, we could start to draw conclusions with water. Water has some very interesting properties to it. In any science class you go into, particularly in the science, science class in the sciences, biology or chemistry, you'll almost always see a chapter or a discussion on water. That's because it is incredibly important. One of the primary reasons why it's very interesting to study 
can come from this. What do we see in each of these pictures? We're seeing different states of matter, and in particular, what matter are we looking at? Water. Water is one of the few compounds that on this planet we can go through and see all of its individual phases relatively easily. Right? There are other element or elements or compounds out there that we could see these, but they're a little bit more difficult to play around with. For instance, in this first case, I know, use your imagination, we're looking at snow, which would be the solid phase for water, which we're going to run into an issue calling it water. And here we've got the liquid phase. And what am I trying to represent here? Boiling water going up into the gas phase. So we have three different phase systems as our qualitative observations for an individual species. Right? And this can become kind of interesting because we can start to draw conclusions about this. The most common one that we're used to is seeing liquid water. Right? And we've got our solids. I wasn't going to write this up, but then I realized I did want to. So we'll go ahead and do it. And our gas. What happens to allow us to interconvert between these? What do we have to do? We have to change the temperature. So we're either adding energy or we're removing energy. Okay. Which brings up the next question, what's happening to water in each of these cases? The molecules are speeding up and slowing down. What is the formula for liquid water? H2O. What is the formula for solid water? H2O. So we remove energy and the structure stays the same. It doesn't change. What ha what's the formula for gaseous water? H2O. Still H2O. Interestingly enough, in some of the reading I've been doing, they've noticed that graduate students in chemistry get into grad school and they're asked the simple question of what are the species above a container of boiling water? And the answer they give, hydrogen and oxygen. Your graduate students in chemistry, what is the species above boiling water? H2O. H2O. It's just gaseous water. We're not changing the compound. It stays the same. So what we're looking at is a physical change, okay? not a chemical one. We're taking different molecules of water, and we're changing how they move. If the water molecules cannot move, we refer to that state as a solid. What if they can now move a little bit more? They can now transition to a liquid. What if they move so much that there is zero interaction between each of the molecules of water? Now we're up at the gas phase. So with these three phases, we can see different properties come out of them. Right? Some of those phases, or some of those things, get sh categorized into, again, qualitative observations. Shape, volume, and compressibility are three of the big ones that your textbook talks about. So if we think about each of these, how do they change? Or can they change? So if we take a look at a solid, okay, what shape does it carry? What's that? For a solid? So if I take a solid, oh, that doesn't work very well, this pen, and I put it into this room, being the container, does my pen change the shape of the container? The solid doesn't change its shape. Can I vary the shape of this pen? Yeah, I can potentially alter this, but it's not dependent on the shape of my container. Quite rigid, even. Okay. Very, very rigid. We don't really see, I mean, it's hard to say shape in this case, but I would really call it not variable. Variable. Not easily. Oh, sorry. Let's pause. Them. So our shape is in this kind of weird category of varying and not varying because we can kind of change it, but it doesn't vary easily. Okay. What about the volume? For a solid. What happens to the volume? 
for any amount of solid, the volume stays relatively constant. We do run into exceptions, but let's not worry about the exceptions. Our volume stays constant, so invariable. Never changes. What about the compressibility? It's very, very rigid. So when we're talking about compressibility, it's if I've got a container of that solid and I try and smash it, does that thing change its size? Okay. Most solids do not compress very well. Okay. So very little, if any at all. Okay. Which comes into play when we look at a combustion engine. What about liquids? What shape? They will kind of take the shape of the container. Okay, for instance, if I took uh, this container of water, well, it's not water, but let's say I filled that up with water. Okay, it takes the shape of that container. And if I pulled it into a different, poured it into a different glass, it takes the shape of that container. But what happens when I pour it into this room? It spreads out. Did it really take the shape of the whole room? Okay, no. Okay, so its volume is still constant. Okay, so it can't occupy any larger volumes. Okay, but the shape is slightly variable or more easily variable, depending on what container is trying to hold it. Okay, compressibility? What's that? How much can you compress a container of water? You can't really compress it that much. Okay? It is, well, when you push it down, and if you're not doing it perfectly, the seal, the water moves up around the edges. And that's because the water doesn't want to compress, so it fills that gap wherever you've got to leak. But if it's perfectly set up where it can't escape, you can compress a little bit, probably a little bit more than a solid, but not by much. So your compressibility is pretty minimal there as well. All right. Well, does that make sense for it to be relatively minimal? Did I spell that right? Yeah, yes. yeah that is an N. Okay. When we move from the solid to the liquid, all we're really doing is allowing those particles to move a little bit. In the solid, they can't move. So they are now in lockstep right next to each other. Should they be able to move? Well, if they're in lockstep next to each other, we packed you all in here like sardines so that you couldn't move, okay? you're not going to be able to compress much. But if we start to pull some of you out of the room, you can now move around a little bit. There's still a little bit of compressive ability because now we've got that extra space where we can push everybody into that corner. Okay, so we get a little bit more compressibility with a liquid. But what happens when we move up to the gas? Okay, if we look at compressibility, we get a lot of compression here. Let's just call it lotto. Why not? Okay. Is that useful to us? Well, if we look at a combustion engine, right, how does the combustion engine work? It's a mini explosion. We've got a piston that traps gas inside it. Then what do you do with the gas? You ignite it. What does the gas do? It explodes upward. It's that heat exchange and some of the compression that's helping build and generate more energy coming out of your engine. So we do use that compressibility of gases fairly frequently. If we also wanted to have a tank of oxygen, okay, there are some people that need more oxygen, usually elder people, that need a little bit more oxygen to survive. They carry around, wheel around a cart of oxygen, right? Okay. How much oxygen would we be able to fit as a gas into a tiny little cylinder? The gas itself isn't going to be all that much, because the gas is going to do what? Move. It wants as much space as possible. So what do we end up putting into those cylinders? We still want oxygen. Change the phase. Drop it down to liquid oxygen. The liquid oxygen doesn't need as much space. So we can now carry a much larger volume of liquid oxygen, or a much larger amount of liquid oxygen in the same volume than we could if we had just used gas. 
Okay, so we can play around and shift between those different phases depending on what we're looking at. Yeah. So that's an interesting question, and it comes back to energy, and it comes back to compressibility. If I take a gas, okay, lots of motion, and I just fill it up in a balloon. I've got that balloon that's filled up with air. What happens as I compress it? What happens to the space between those molecules? It gets tighter. It gets tighter and tighter. What happens to the amount of motion that those individual particles can do? It lessens. It lessens. If I keep compressing it and keep compressing it, eventually what happens to the space between those atoms? It disappears. And it starts to change phases into a liquid or a solid. So what happens inside the tank? Well, those tanks are under extremely high pressures because what are we doing? We're compressing that gas to keep it a liquid. So how does it turn into a gas? Well, at the little spigot, when you open it up, what happens to the pressure? It dramatically reduces the pressure. Now we're in the gas phase. So when we think about these individual phases, it's not just temperature. Because when do we get solid ice? Anybody? Solid ice? The freezing point, so we can look at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. When do we get uh, gaseous H2O? 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius? Okay. They're temperature dependent. But if we take that same container of water and we change our altitude, what happens? The boiling point will change. The freezing point will not change as much. But the boiling point changes drastically. Because what else changes as we change altitude? Oxygen. The pressure. There's less pressure at higher altitudes, which means there's nothing holding those water molecules down. So what do they do? Boom. They immediately jump out and take up as much space as they can in the gaseous state. Okay. So we can look at how these different things interact with each other and how we can take advantage of them to do what we want them to. When we look at the volume, what volume do our gases have? Gases hold no volume. So if I breathe into a balloon, it doesn't do anything. It just wiggles. Variable, sort of. When we look at the volume of our solids and and liquids, they kind of sort of match the container they're in. Gases fill the entire container. So if I exhale here, uh, sorry for you, where does that air come out of my mouth? What does it fill? The room. The entire room. So every single one of you is breathing my nasty, stinky ass air. Because <laughs> okay? it fills the entire room. But if I was exhaling liquid water, you guys in the back probably don't care. Everybody up here probably has an issue. Okay? Because that liquid water is only going to travel to the immediate area, and it's not going to fill the entire container. Air or gases will. So they fill our entire container, which means what about the shape? Extremely variable. Okay? To the point where we might say they don't have a shape. Because what shape will they have? The exact same shape as the container that holds them. Okay? Whereas liquids and solids, solids hold the shape of whatever you've molded them into, liquids will sort of hold the shape of their container up to their volume. Once we've exceeded their volume, they can't occupy that shape anymore. Okay? Whereas our gases will fully expand. So kind of interesting process. We can then drop this into other states. Okay, we can look at matter. So matter is the summary of everything that we ever know to exist as solid, liquid, or gas. Anything made up of anything off of our periodic table classifies under matter. We can now subcategorize matter into two different sections. We can look at it as a mixture. We could also look at it as a pure substance. Okay, and this is where things can get a bit weird. We just looked at our first compound. H2O. Is it a mixture or is it a pure substance?
It's a pure substance. Every time I take any sample of H2O, it's going to be exactly H2NO. Every single time. If I reach in, I will always get that exact same thing. Okay. So we're looking at a pure substance there. That pure substance happens to be a combination of two things. But those two things are always found in that combination for the compound of water. Or for the substance of water, I should say. What happens if we now look at that pure substance? We can subcategorize that pure substance now into compounds versus elements. So a compound is going to be a combination of different elements. So what is water? It's a compound because it is a combination of hydrogen and oxygen in this exact ratio of two hydrogens to one oxygen. What would be the elements that made up? We would have hydrogen and we would have oxygen. Okay. Technically not the true symbols there, but that's close enough. We've got hydrogen as an element and oxygen as an element. Everything found on our periodic table is an element. Hence, it's called the periodic table of elements. elements. Okay. If we now start to combine elements to make compounds or make things, substances that have new properties where those properties are different from the original, that's where we end up generating these compounds and we can run into other substances. If we don't have a pure substance, our other option is an impure substance. Impure is kind of negative, so we call it a mixture instead. So a mixture is where we've combined multiple different things, but they aren't physically connected to each other. Okay? Within mixtures, we have two options, homogeneous and heterogeneous. <clears throat> homogeneous means when I grab, reach into that mixture, I will pull out, with all intents and purposes, the exact same number of things as if I reached in at a different point in the solution. So I get the exact same stuff. So what we're looking at is pretty much the same phase. Okay. And that can be a little bit tricky, so we'll look at some phases, phase examples in that. Whoops, except I wrote that under heterogeneous. Whereas heterogeneous is? Chunky. chunky. Nice way to describe it. Make that a little bit cleaner. We call it different phases. That sounds like an example from the homework. We could look at orange juice with pulp. Okay, pulp is typically what phase? It's a solid. What is our juice? A liquid. We have a mixture of phases. Okay. And if we give it long enough, what can eventually end up happening is our pulp could settle out. And we'd have a distinct solid and a distinct liquid just both in the same container. If we move to a homogeneous phase, though, they are now completely and evenly mixed, okay? and they don't settle out. Examples of this, salt water. Whoops, except salt water doesn't have an H or a double L. <laughs> salt water is taking sodium chloride and adding it to H2O. What phase is sodium chloride? Solid. What phase is water? Liquid. Uh-oh. How is this a homogeneous mixture? Because it's water soluble. There's another phase. So the phases we've got, solid, liquid, and gas, and the new phase is? Aqueous. What does aqueous mean? Dissolved. Dissolved in water. In water. Why would we use that as a new phase? Why would that be such an important phase to include? Previous slide, right at the very beginning of it, we talked about 70 to 80 percent of the earth was made up of water. Okay. Most of that water, or a lot of that water at least, is in what phase? Liquid. Liquid. Where are most things existing? In water. Okay. 
So we are looking at this aqueous phase as being a massively important phase because almost all life as we know it is based in water. So aqueous, having things dissolved in water, is a new phase for us to evaluate. Okay. The balance and interplay between these is what we end up using and taking advantage of when we go through and deal with uh, chemistry and trying to decide if reactions have occurred. Okay. Now that we've got our phases, we can pull information up to our periodic table and start to pull some information out of it. Okay. When we went through and initially started classifying elements, and our building our periodic table, we started to notice different trends. And people started to subcategorize them into different areas. Okay. The first categorization was coming up with metals and nonmetals. Okay. Why? What's an example of a metal? Too many examples. I think I heard titanium. Uh, let's go with gold. I like gold better. Uh, kind of. Uh, what's an example of a nonmetal? Non-metal element, to be fair, so that was my fault, we'll run with hydrogen. Okay. If we take a look at uh, gold, what phase is it? Solid. What phase is hydrogen? Gas. Those are distinctly different phases. Okay. It turns out they have distinctly different properties. So our initial categorization went based off of what we could physically observe of each of these. Hydrogen we saw as a gas. Nitrogen we saw as a gas. Oxygen we saw as a gas. Okay. Sodium, iron, gold, titanium, we classified as metals. Okay. And that's because some of their bulk properties were comparable within each of those sections. So when we look at our metals, they are mainly solids. Okay. Almost all of them are solids. If we look at our nonmetals, almost all of them are gases, though we do see some solids pop in there as well. Okay, if we look at other physical observables, qualitative observations, most of our metals shine. Look at gold. Okay, you can kind of look at iron. A lot of them have kind of a luster and a sheen to them. Whereas our nonmetals, they're gases, it's not very easy to see a shine off of a gas. Okay? But if we shift to a non-metal solid, anybody know a non-metal solid? Magnesium. Mm, sorry. It is a solid, but it's a metal. Iron? Iron's a metal. Carbon. Carbon is not a metal. Okay? When we look at carbon, don't think diamonds. Think graphite. We look at graphite or pencil lead. What's the sheen or the color to it? It's usually dull. If we then shift to what we can do with them, what happens when I hit it? That's what humans tend to do with everything. Huh? New object, let's hit it, see what happens. Metals tend to be malleable. We can bend them and shape them, which is why we build jewelry out of a lot of different metals, gold, silver, platinum, why we work with iron. When we shift to our non-metals, they tend to be brittle. Okay? Hit your carbon pencil against the desk really hard. Don't do that, you'll probably break your pencil. Okay? And the carbon inside it. They tend to be very brittle. If we look at how they conduct electricity, metals conduct electricity very, very well, which is why what wire is typically found in our walls and our buildings? Copper. copper, because copper is a metal. Okay. We don't find carbon wires very often. And that's because carbon does not conduct electricity very well. We can argue that later if you really want to. We can look at density differences. We can look at melting points. And okay? we can look at reactivity. So we've kind of come up with these classifications between these two. Okay? What makes that really fun is that we just mentioned metals and nonmetals. Okay? There's a third one up there. Okay? If we look at our periodic table, do you see a clear line that says one is metals and one is nonmetals? No. Not really. Everything is kind of sequenced right next to another element. Okay, so there isn't a clear definitive line saying division, boom, metal versus non-metal. Okay. So what happens is in that transition, becoming a metal to a non-metal, we end up with something that's kind of in between, a mix of both. That mix of both ends up being our metalloids or the, as you just looked it up, semi-metals. Semi okay, something that is similar to the metals. 
That division is there because what ends up happening for those individual elements? They have properties of both. Some of them appear like nonmetals. Some of them appear like metals. Right? Because we're in that weird gray area, it becomes harder to classify just based off these qualitative observations. So we take a look at the pictures up top. Those pictures are likely representative of which category? Metals. Why do you say metals? They're all shiny. How about this next sequence? Nonmetals. Why? They've got to be a little bit difficult to process this one. Okay. They aren't particularly shiny, though we've got one that's glowing as a light in between. Okay. Why is it glowing as a light? We've got glass wrapped around both of these elements. That glass is trapping a liquid here, and that glass is trapping a gas in this case. Why is there light? When you shove a bunch of electric prods up you, you'd probably glow too. And that's what's happening with our neon light. Okay. We've got a trapped gas of neon. Actually, I think it's argon. Uh, and we've jammed a bunch of electric current through it. And it lights up nice and bright for us. Last one is carbon fibers, just to make it interesting. How about these? Metalloids, why do you say that? They're all shiny. Last option, good call. Process of elimination, it works well. Okay, these are examples of our metalloids. They're a lot harder to figure out because they have some of the properties of each of these. And all we're really looking at is what they look like, our physical observation. Solids don't allow us to really draw much conclusions. We saw gas, I see it. We could say it's non-metal, but if they were solids, we can't differentiate between them. So what do we move to? We could look at luster. Okay. Is it shiny or is it dull? So we could differentiate our metals and our non-metals based off of that, but as soon as we hit the metalloids, we're running at a mixture between those two. So more than likely, they will be shiny. With the picture alone, can we draw any other conclusions? All those other things, we have to do something to it. Okay? Without that ability to do something to it, we have to pull at something else. What's that extra information? So you guys so astutely pointed out, it's the third option left. Okay. So you don't have to pull off of something standard. You can start to think outside the box and look at our other conclusions. And yes, I will sometimes be a jerk and throw stuff up anyway. Yes? Uh, how come mercury is not a metalloid? So you'll notice under our list here that we say most are solids, and most are solids or gases. Neither of them mention anything about liquids, which is a bit bizarre. Why is that a bit bizarre? Are there any liquid elements? There, are two. Yeah. there are two of them. Those two happen to be mercury and bromine. Bromine is a nonmetal, and mercury is a metal. It is lustrous. It is malleable. Any liquid would be malleable. Uh, it conducts electricity well. It conducts heat well. It matches all of those other properties. So mercury is an outlier in the fact that it is a liquid, not a solid, but you'll notice our category does not say only solids. Okay? So the bulk properties of mercury classify it as a metal. Okay? How would we know whether it was a solid, a liquid, or a gas? If it's a metal, what's its phase? Probably a solid. Okay, so you could probably get away guessing that solid and move on. What happens if it's a non-metal? How do we know its phase? Where do you find selenium? That's a problem. Okay, so if you don't know where it's found, we've got to come up with another way to figure it out. Let's take a look at the periodic table. You can look to either side. Name a metal. Silver. Silver. What's the symbol for silver? AG, where is AG? 47. 47, kind of in the middle of our periodic table. Metal or non-metal? Metal. metal. Give me a non-metal. Argon. Don't give me hydrogen, that's cheating. Argon or helium, where are those elements? The extreme right. Is there a difference on the periodic table other than the location? The color. The color. We do have a difference in column, too. 
but most people hopefully would see the color. Way to think outside the box, it's a good thing. Okay. What's going on with that color? What phase was oxygen? Blood. What phase? No, oxygen so is O, uh, is a gas. gas. Where is it on our periodic table? To the right. To the right. Okay. Uh, nitrogen. Gas. Hmm, what color was it? On the periodic table. We're looking at red. What does that red versus black mean? Different states. Black means? Red means? How else might you figure that out? Take a look at the key on the periodic table at the very bottom, and it says black is? Solid. Red is gas. we got two elements that are floating out there as differences. Both of those are blue, which are kind of hard to pick out, but we got bromine at 35 and mercury at 80. They're both colored blue. What does that blue mean? They are liquids. Okay. All elements can hit all of the possible phases. So why are we categorizing these as solid liquids and gases then? They're natural states. So we're looking at room temperature or ambient temperature, that's where these elements are going to be found in their particular phases. What does synthetically prepared mean? Synthetically prepared means some crazy physicist in a massive expensive building smashed a bunch of atoms together and they made a new element. Yeah. It's a bit crazy and expensive. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider has the a potential to do that. There's a facility in Palo Alto owned by Stanford or Berkeley, I think, that can do the same thing. So if you take a look at the actual names for a lot of those ones that are uh, outlined, uh, CM96 is, uh, actually, I don't know if it's 96 or 98. I think it's 98. 96 is curium. So what's 98? Californium. Why do you think it was called Californium? They made it in California. Okay. And 97, I think, is berkelium because it was... 95. Yep. Well, take it a step further. Uh, 106 SG, I believe, is seaborgium for the scientist Seaborg. Okay. So scientists do have exceptionally large egos. And sometimes some of it is actually not because they discovered it, but because enough people thought they were really cool. For instance, 99? 99. Einsteinium. Einsteinium. He didn't discover that, but we thought he was cool enough to, to name it after him. What's that? 95 is my favorite. What's 95? Merkum. Uh, I think the pronunciation is a little bit different than Americum, but <laughs> I think it's Americium is how we're politically supposed to say that. But, yeah. Okay. So, if we take a, a step beyond our exaggerated egos, we can look at some other rules. Uh, we will list off some scientists' names that come out of these. Some of them are important. Some of them aren't as important. Uh, Lavoisier, as a name, uh, not a bad one to just kind of remember just for the sake of it, but I don't think I'll ever test you on this. Okay. Uh, what he was responsible for, among other things, was this theory of a conservation of mass. So that means if I start with 20 grams of a solid, let's say firewood, and I burn 20 grams of firewood, completely toast it, what do I end with? 20 grams of ash and gas. So when we go through and burn firewood, we are converting it to CO2 and water. The ash is the stuff that we couldn't quite burn all the way through. Okay? So if we trap all of that gas and the solid remnants that are left over, it had better total to exactly 20 grams. Wouldn't it not, though? It will. Uh, not to a significant amount for our balances to determine. Um, so we get this theory of a conservation of mass, and it does get tweaked to account for the energy uh, a little bit later. But we're looking at 
mid to late 1700s. Give a guy a little bit of credit here. Okay. It's going to be hard to measure uh, the mass change for an energy. We really kind of have to wait for Einstein to come up with that relationship. Okay. So mathematically, when we go through and look at this, that our mass numbers have to be the same. So if I take hydrogen and react it with oxygen, I can predict the mass of how much water is going to be produced out of this. If I take 5 grams of hydrogen and 5 grams of oxygen, and I'm somehow able to convert that all into water, how much water do I end up with? Let me write that out because I said that. If I take 5 grams of hydrogen and 5 grams of oxygen, and all of that gets converted into water, how many grams of water do I end up with? Ten. Two? Ten grams. I'm gonna, I guess I misheard you. Sorry. I apologize. Ten grams. Conservation of mass. We cannot destroy it. Okay. If we went through and looked at wood and oxygen generating gas and water, let's go through five grams of wood, five grams of oxygen, and you produce eight grams of water. This is where the conservation of mass becomes dicey. Because if we go through and do this, scientists runs this experiment and they say, I get eight grams. That's not conservation of mass. But when a scientist initially first ran this experiment, what did they probably not take into consideration? The gas. How much gas was produced? Two grams. Okay. It's not easy to work with gas phases. So most typically, that's where a lot of mistakes were made in the early discoveries, because we can't trap gases quite as easily. Okay? And that's where people potentially like Lavoisier could get made fun of, because, hey, no, your theory doesn't work, because 5 plus 5 is not 8, buddy. Okay? But what he was able to do was to help show how people are miscalculating, what they're missing in the process of these reactions. Okay? So what happens when we actually put these things together? So Proust, another famous dead scientist, uh, looked at oxygen reacting with different metals. And what he ended up noticing was that the amount of oxygen consumed by presumably the same amount of mass of a metal uh, was different for different metals. But he also noticed that they combined in the exact same ratios. So if he changed the mass of a particular metal, that changed the amount of oxygen he had to react with it. Right? And what he defined this as was the law of definite composition. Meaning if I go through and run a reaction, the ratios between the elements involved in that new product have to be exactly the same. Okay? They aren't going to magically change or get weird numbers. You're always going to end up with the exact same results. So it's your law of definite proportions. Okay? Dalton pushed this a little bit further and led this into atomic theory which we will talk about significantly more when we start talking about our periodic table. Um, whoops. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. In Dalton's atomic theory, he goes through and summarizes these individual things. You notice that picture on the right, not the weird-looking red sun? Or that picture on the right? Anybody know what that is? Periodic table of the elements. Wouldn't you love to have a periodic table of elements looking like that? Okay. Or really, his periodic table is that top three rows. Okay. So instead of drawing out H2O, we'd have circle with a dot in, the, in it, two. Or actually, we wouldn't have a two. We'd have two of those circles with a dot in it and another one with a funky little snowflake in the middle of it. Okay. So instead of having nice, simple letters to work with, we'd have to draw out all these fancy symbols. Okay. But what he was able to do was start to piece some of this information together, come up with some kind of notation to talk about or really draw these projects or these thoughts. Okay. And he had a bunch of different theories associated with it and how he developed and further processed that. Okay. So it's kind of a neat idea. How is this all measured? Okay. How can we get them? to go through and do these things. That, to me, is still a fascinating subject because we're looking in the 1700s. How do they actually measure these things out accurately enough to be able to determine uh, real values and come to correct conclusions? So they have to be very selective with what materials they use to study. There are some compounds that we can isolate relatively quickly and easily, okay, and they can do different studies on them. 
We can add heat. Okay? When we add heat to water, what happens? Boils, turns into a gas. If we trap that gas and cool it down, what happens? We get back to water. The exact same thing. So nothing happened. But what happens if we take heat to KClO4? All of a sudden, it turns into something, but when we cool it back down, we don't get the exact same components. So a reaction had to have occurred. We changed the bond order. Okay, we've got a chemical reaction versus a physical reaction, or physical change versus a chemical change. It's those chemical changes that are a starting chemist we're starting to evaluate and determine. We can look at these to determine hydrates. Right? We can look at the composition of water in an individual salt compound. We can shift to electrolysis. We can pump a bunch of electricity through a solution, and we can watch molecules precipitate out. We can look at combustion. This is a particularly fun one. Take an organic molecule, you pump it into a system, blow it up with a bunch of heat, and you look at all the pieces that come out of it. And you trap those individual pieces further on down the line. So we can start to evaluate how much carbon, hydrogen, or nitrogen was present by looking for the presence of products that we know need to come out of it. Right? So all of that information starts to build us towards getting a periodic table and understanding something about these elements and matter and what we can do with them. Right? So we got our periodic table. In theory, you have access to Canvas now. When am I done? 155. 155. I will eventually remember that. Uh, so when you get access to Canvas again, it should be under, I think I do have it labeled as helpful files, and elements for memory. That means with our periodic table, you are required to have some of these things memorized because that is effectively our language. And you don't walk into a Spanish class and get mad when they tell you you have to know verb conjugations okay? because that's the language. That's why you're in the class. You're in the same thing here. But there's 118 different elements up there. That's a lot to memorize, particularly when you consider how much other things we could stack on top of it, not even to mention the numbers associated with each of those elements. So I do want you to memorize some of them, but not all of them. If you take a look at this elements for memory file, it's a list of 60 elements, maybe. I think it's less than that. Some of them are bolded. Right? The initial file I got was from another faculty. Right? The bolding was done by me. Why would I bold elements? They're the ones that you are more than likely going to see. Those are the ones that you will most commonly see. So carbon, nitrogen, pretty much anything in the first three rows okay, are elements you're going to have to have memorized. So you need to know their name, and you need to know their symbol. You need to know how to spell them. It's a harder question. What do you think? Uh, we will be using symbols most frequently, but you will have to be able to interpret back and forth between name and symbol. When do you have to spell something? When you write it out. Your exams are primarily multiple choice. Do you have to write it out? No. So the spelling isn't that big of an issue. I will say on the little in-class quizzes, Get as close as you can with the spelling. I might make fun of you a little bit if you spell it way weird. Okay? <laughs> but you'll still get points for it. Okay? It's trying to show that you're picking up what these names and symbols mean. Okay? That said, there are always some fun elements to throw at you that don't involve spelling. Okay? If you look at hydrogen, the symbol for hydrogen is H. It's kind of useful because hydrogen begins with H. That's nice. Okay, the next element on the periodic table is HE for helium. Oh, look at that. First two letters. Okay, pretty sweet. Works out pretty well. We could even jump to aluminum. Okay, we get the same result. But now let's jump to gold. What happened? 
remember, there's a lot of history behind the periodic table. Okay? So a lot of the symbols that are chosen are chosen for some historical reasons. Typically, the older the element, the more goofy the symbology comes with it, okay? depending on when it was discovered. Because it was discovered probably by a Greek or a Latin person. You see a lot of German names show up as well, because the Germans were really good at discovering elements. Okay? So we have to draw some conclusions from that. English is kind of a nice language in that respect, because English is so bastardized from different languages and cultures that most of them kind of translate across. Right, particularly when it comes to German, but not all of them. So you got to watch out for those. The other ones that you got to watch out for are the two that I just circled. We have nickel and we have nitrogen. What's the problem? They both start with N and they both have a second letter of I. So one of these needs to win over the other. How do we decide that? You could go through and uh, memorize something about the origins of these, or you just go through and memorize it straight up. Nickel is the Ni. Whoops. I said nickel just because I can't read. Don't blame me. Nitrogen is our N. Okay. There are other, other elements that pop up like this, like potassium. <coughs> Potassium is another fun one, okay? because if we run through and just run off the first two letters, or even the first letter, first letter is P. Why is that a problem? It's a symbol on our periodic table. Second letter is O. What's the problem with that? PO is also, yeah, there it is, 84, is also an element on our periodic table. What's the symbol for potassium, P or PO? K. 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 Okay. Good, you already know all this. So watch out for those little loopholes. It's going to take some time to review it and make sure that you're comfortable with it. Take a look at that file uh, to make sure that you're comfortable with the elements that are listed. Okay. Compounds and chemical formulas. We take a look at a big compound here. Anybody know the compound? All of you probably ingest it. No, oh, sugar. uh, sugar's too boring. Okay. That wouldn't have been a bad one, but I don't like sugar. No. No. Caffeine. It's the structure of caffeine. Right? Go figure, we call it caffeine and not all of those different symbols. It makes it a lot easier to say caffeine. Right? How could we go through and talk about this? If I wanted to look at its chemistry, drawing the structure is going to be the best option. But I might want to come up with another way to represent it. What might be an easier way to represent this compound? What do you mean letters and subscripts? I agree. Whoa. Hello. You're right. Keep going. So you take H, count how many H's there are, and you subscript of whatever the number of the count is. Let me count one, two, three, four, five, ten. So the formula is H10? Okay. Carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And we could go through and figure out all of those numbers, whatever they may be, and include those as subscripts after each of those elements. We now have a formula. Okay. So our formula can condense our structure down into something easier to digest and manipulate. It tells us some information about this. Because okay, hydrogen is the only one we've looked at so far. If I give you one molecule of caffeine, how many hydrogen atoms are present? Ten. What if I give you 40 molecules? Oops, I can't do that math. Uh, seven molecules of caffeine. Seventy. Why? Seven times ten. Okay. Don't laugh at me. That's a, seri that's a pretty massive leap as far as understanding what that formula means because you're going to have to use that conversion factor later on in the semester. So it's being aware of what these formulas mean and how we can use them. That said, moving into organic chemistry, how useful is a formula? Crappy. Formulas are almost useless, because in organic chemistry, I don't care about the numbers of those atoms. I care about how those atoms interact with other atoms. 
Where is that shown? In the structure. Right. So organic chemistry is all about drawing these massive structures and seeing how they interact with each other. Can't be right all the time. So we went through and took a look at a couple of these. Sounds like you guys are fairly confident with it, but let's jump to this one here. How many atoms are in that compound? Let's pause, think about it a little bit. We have to be careful with how the question is phrased. I asked for the number of atoms. The number of atoms within this would be all of the elements and their totals from each. So I have one hydrogen here, two carbons here, plus three hydrogens here, plus two oxygens. That was eight. What if I asked for the number of molecules? One. Why? Because all one molecule. Is the, formula for one molecule. the molecule is referring to this entire unit. The number of molecules will get specified where? Right in front. There's no number written there. Okay? If there's nothing written, there's only two options that we can assume would be present. Zero or one? If it's zero, would that make sense? Why not? Because it wouldn't be there. Zero times anything is zero. So if I'm going to put a zero in front, that's a pretty useless piece of information. So the number assumed is one. Number of elements. We've got one with our hydrogen. We've got two with our carbon. Now I run into an issue. There's another hydrogen there. What's the difference between hydrogen and hydrogen? Nothing. It's the exact same element. Three with our oxygen. We have three elements. Yes? This might be a silly question. Why are those two hydrogens separated? Then? Why aren't they just... Why are the hydrogens not grouped with each other? Another feature of formulas. Depending on what we are trying to do, we may want to accent different information. So if I wanted to understand something more about the structure of the compound, I don't want a formula. I want that big, long, and I'm going to erase everything, structure here. I want to see where everything is located. If I don't care about what the structure looks like or how it interacts, I just want to account for what atoms are present, a formula works great. H2O, C6H6O6. But when we look at those next two options, I didn't group all of the elements with like elements. I separated them out. The reason they're separated out is because in this case, what I'm trying to accent is that this hydrogen has unique chemical environments from the other hydrogen. Okay. Close. Do the other one. Not a base, but... It's an acid. Okay. So what we'll see when we get into the chapter when we start looking at reactivity is that you can identify acids by seeing that hydrogen in front for this class. Okay. So I've changed the formula to represent something to help me see that. When we move over to this compound, I'm doing the same thing here except this compound's not an acid. But the hydrogen is bound to what element? The oxygen. So I'm trying to now imply something about where that hydrogen is connected. I'm implying the hydrogen's bound to the oxygen. If I just give the formula, there's a ton of different options on how I could draw that structure. So I'm trying to provide a little bit more information and kind of back away from the raw, just tier of the elements. Okay? Good question. Other questions? really hoping you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> we do run into issues when we're looking at 
formulas and trying to interpret something about structure. And we make sacrifices in certain areas. Okay, so one of the sacrifices by moving to a formula is we don't see where all the atoms are connected. We can imply some of that characteristics by, say, what we did over here, putting the hydrogen next to the oxygen to say that the hydrogen was bound to the oxygen. When we get to this one, what we're trying to do is give you information to tell you that that is an acid. Okay? You don't need to know anything about why it's an acid. Okay? All you need to know is that it's an acid because there's a hydrogen in front. Where is the hydrogen actually bound? The oxygen, unfortunately. Okay. If I put the hydrogen over here, out in front, I'm now implying this is an acid. So our slight variances in our formulas imply different pieces of information, depending on what we're trying to get at. Okay. And when we go through and use these, we'll start to manipulate them and review where they're coming from. I just want you to be aware that they can fluctuate and change around on you. Yeah? So, when the molecules are the, uh, yeah, the molecules are you got to build off of each other as well, when it starts to create itself, like, the acid is the base, and everything just attaches along and creates that. So, when you're starting to look at building larger structures, you have to activate atoms to interact at the appropriate energies which is going to be beyond the scope of this class. What we'll end up doing is, yeah, I know, giving you rules that say when you have an acid, it reacts with a base. When you have a, a solid of some particular configuration, it dissolves in water. When you have a solid of a different configuration, it does not dissolve in water. Okay? So we'll give you rules that you just have to follow you aren't given the material to be able to process why for each of those rules. Okay? That why process, in case any of you are going, why don't you tell me that, is for another year worth of chemistry afterwards. Okay? So it does get kind of developed as you move through it, and the black and whites that we tell you now turn into grays in the future. Okay? Only five more minutes. At least I didn't say an hour this time. Chemical versus physical observations. Uh, this is brought up now. I want you to be very, very careful with it. We will talk about it in a lot more depth later on uh, after exam two. Right, the very first thing we talk about after exam two is reactions and deciding what is a chemical versus physical reaction. It does show up in the book, which is why we have to address it. The reason why it's tricky is that they make it look like it's this really simple black and white system. It's not. Okay? There are all sorts of weird exceptions that fall within these. Physical properties okay, are observable characteristics that don't alter the elemental composition. So we don't change from elements to a different compound or a compound to a new compound. But what makes a compound? The silence is deafening. Right? And very telling for why this is a horrible definition. You don't know what a compound is yet. Right? So if you don't know how the elemental composition can change, how can you possibly know if it's a physical property or a chemical property? Right? The primary distinction between these two has to do with reversibility. Okay? And you will be doing a lab on this next week, which is going to get to the same kind of idea. A physical property is one that is reversible, okay, or easily reversible. So when we look at boiling water, okay, we transfer liquid water into gaseous water. But then what happens when we remove that energy, or that heat? What does the gaseous water do? It goes back to being liquid water. Okay, that is a physical observation. Okay, it is one that is easily reversible. When we move to a chemical property, that's how different elements react with each other, or different compounds react with each other to form new compounds. Okay? That process is not easy for you to physically observe, which is why I don't like your first lab, because you're going to go through and do things, and you're going to be like, I don't know. It looked like it changed phases. Okay? Does that make it a chemical change or a physical change? Well, changing phase going from uh, a liquid to a gas was a physical observation. But 
I can take a compound such as uh, sodium bicarbonate. Okay? It's a solid. I can add heat to that, and it'll turn into a gas. That's a phase change. Was that a chemical observation or a physical observation? Based on what we just saw with our liquids, that would be physical. Turns out it's chemical. How do you know that? You don't yet because you don't understand reactions. Okay? So when you're looking at these physical versus chemical properties, think about it in the reversibility. When we heat up that sodium carbonate, when we remove the energy, it doesn't reform. Okay? We don't see it anymore. It's disappeared. Okay? That disappearing process is because we change the chemical composition of it to something else. That something else has an entirely different phase that we can't trap as easily. Yes? I was going to ask, did the heat just cause the bonds to break? Or? Rearrange? Yes. The heat causes the bonds to rearrange. So some kind of rough guidelines on this. What observables suggest a chemical change? These in general work. Release of a gas. So if we add a solid into a liquid and we see gas, typically a chemical change. Change in temperature. But when I add heat to water, I'm adding heat. The temperature changes, does it not? Why is that not a, a chemical change? I've added the heat. So when we see the change in temperature, it's because I mix two chemicals, I back away, and now I test the temperature. I'm not putting in heat, I'm not taking out heat. I'm letting the chemicals decide what they're going to do, and then I monitor that temperature change of what they did. All right? Phase change, same kind of idea. If you see a phase change, if we see that release of gas or the formation of a solid, did you add heat or remove heat? Okay? If you don't do it, then it's a chemical change. Okay? Permanent color changes, massive exception to this one. You're making a cake. You need red frosting. Okay, what do you do? Don't tell me buy red frosting. You add food coloring to white frosting. Okay? Is that a physical change or a chemical change? That's a permanent color change. Okay? It is a physical change, not a chemical change. Okay? All we're doing is diluting that color. We're mixing that in. It does not mean that we're making a chemical reaction. Very challenging until you look at the individual reactions. So the best way to think about this is as a spectrum. Think about these observations when you're thinking about chemical versus physical. We will start with this on Tuesday. Right? It's a spectrum.